Thank you, Dr. Clayton. Um, and I uh, am so pleased to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, to speak with you today and to meet some of the committee members and to see some of the committee members who I already know. Um, and I really am very grateful for the work that you all are going to begin to do. This first meeting is a culmination of a year-long effort at HHS to support development of clinical diagnostic criteria, criteria for myalgic encephalomyelitis and chronic fatigue syndrome. Next slide. Do I do that here? Got it. Okay. In 2012, the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee, or CIFSAC, recommended to the Secretary of HHS that she convene a workshop to reach a consensus for research and clinical case definitions for MECFS. Because of the considerable need for faster and more accurate diagnosis for patients, HHS asked the IOM to use its well-established and well-regarded consensus process Thanks to provide guidance to the broader medical community on how to identify and diagnose MECFS in the clinical setting. HHS envisions that the recommendations from this study will reach healthcare providers likely to see patients who may have CFS but haven't yet been diagnosed. This would include primary care providers as well as some specialty groups. HHS has asked that four specific tasks be addressed, which I will walk you through now. For the purposes of this study, HHS uses MECFS to refer to conditions that include myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, chronic fatigue and immune dysfunction syndrome, neuroendocrine immune disorders, as well as other terminologies. These may be distinct disease entities, part of a spectrum, or a similar phenotypic response to a variety of external or internal assaults on the individual. The first task focuses on reviewing available scientific literature regarding signs and symptoms and diagnosis of MECFS. The review would include published peer-reviewed research on MECFS including proven and potential biomarkers, the pathophysiology, natural history, and epidemiology of MECFS, and neurologic, immunologic, infectious, cardiovascular, and endocrine aspects of the disease. The review would also include literature describing the symptomatology of MECFS. We ask that you consider the variety and range of symptoms, including disease severity. It's also important to consider the distinction between generalized chronic fatigue with known etiology, unexplained chronic fatigue without associated multisystem illness, and the more specific syndrome of myalgic encephalomyelitis. HHS believes that it is of prime importance to get stakeholder input into the evidence collection process. We are pleased that representatives from the advocate and patient community are on today's agenda. We are also pleased that your committee includes individuals with long-standing experience in MECFS, both professional and personal. As the committee reviews the literature, we ask that you consider the existing definitions and criteria listed here, listed here and build upon them as appropriate. As you probably know, there has been support from a number of advocates and experts in the field for, two, for the 2003 MECFS Canadian Consensus Definition. Some of the members of this committee have gone on the record as supporting these clinical criteria. The CIFSAC recommendation made in 2012 that I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation encouraged that the re-examination of the MECFS case definition process, quote, begin with the 2003 Canadian consensus definition, close quote. Perhaps some of the stakeholders speaking, to, speaking later today will discuss why this definition is preferred over the 2010 revised Canadian version. Here is the second task. HHS asks 
that as you develop your recommendations, you evaluate clinical diagnostic criteria to determine whether existing criteria are adequate for medical practitioners to diagnose the individual patient with ME-CFS or whether criteria need to be revised or whether new criteria are needed. The criteria should account for the various and distinct subpopulation of individuals with ME-CFS. One subpopulation to consider is children. The committee may well decide that different criteria are needed for different disease entities that fall under the broad umbrella of MECFS. This could help health pr care providers distinguish between these different conditions. Notably, there is debate whether ME and CFS are distinct entities or different names for the same or similar syndrome. As you develop your recommendations, please consider the specificity, sensitivity, and reliability of the clinical criteria. HHS would also like to have recommendations on a process for revising and updating the criteria in the future as needed. Disagreement exists among clinical experts, patients, and advocates as to the best terminology or terminologies for MECFS. For the third task, we ask that you review the various terminologies that refer to MECFS, identify the clinical distinctions among them, if any, and make recommendations for clinical diagnostic criteria for the distinct entities. These terminologies include, but are not limited to, neuro immu neuroendocrine immune disorder, myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, and chronic fatigue immune deficiency syndrome. If the committee decides new terminology is needed for the conditions, provide recommendations for the new terminologies. Different names may be warranted. Please know that there are many people, scientists, clinicians, advocates, who believe the name chronic fatigue syndrome does harm to patients. I agree. Lastly, HHS asks that you recommend strategies to disseminate these criteria nationwide to enhance awareness and responsiveness to ME-CFS patients. If the committee recommends name changes, incorporate that recommendation in the dissemination plan. We ask that you recommend strategies to increase the number of primary and specialty healthcare professionals who recognize and diagnose ME-CFS and can, be, can distinguish between other conditions causing neuro, neuroendocrine immune dysfunction generalized chronic fatigue, and ME-CFS. We recognize that making a diagnosis is just a first step, and that many of the healthcare providers who make the diagnosis will not have sufficient knowledge and experience to manage their patient's complex condition. We also recognize that there are too few providers in the U.S. with expertise in managing ME-CFS. HHS has not asked the committee to address this problem, however. Pushing out the criteria to a wide audience of health professionals is such a critical need. As you know, the 2003 Canadian consensus criteria are widely embraced by many MECFS experts and patient advocates, but they are not well known beyond these groups. Whatever the committee develops needs to get into textbooks and widely read journals and be at the top of a Google search. For example, the lead article in the November 6th issue of JAMA was a summary of a new IOM report on improving quality of cancer care in the elderly. Perhaps an article about MECFS diagnostic criteria will be the lead in JAMA in a couple of years. To close, I would like to note that these two ongoing HHF efforts on this slide concern, are, 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 I would like to note these two ongoing HHS efforts. HHS has requested that the committee coordinate with these efforts in order to minimize overlap and maximize synergy. You will be hearing more details from Drs. Unger and Meyer today. HHS is most grateful for your willingness to take on this challenging task. I've been working on CIFSAC for two and a half years. From that position, I understand how important it is that all MECFS patients have health care providers that know about this serious condition can make or at least suspect the diagnosis and, if appropriate, 
refer to providers experienced in managing their disease. This is a desperate situation for so many, and my hope is that this study will be a major step in improving the clinical care and lives of these patients. Another benefit is that widely accepted and widely disseminated clinical diagnostic criteria will facilitate the research efforts that are needed to understand and to treat MECFS. We recognize that coming up with diagnostic criteria may not be easy. We can only hope ongoing and future research efforts will soon make diagnosis much easier. But patients and providers need help and guidance now. We need to go forward with what we know. Thanks again for what you are doing for, for patients with MECFS and their families and friends. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Let me open the um, floor to my colleagues um, who, if you want to talk, please raise your uh, tents. But I'll start out by asking, there are two other, uh, there are two other e efforts that we know are going to be, um, that we're going to hear more about, but I would like to hear from you um, how, these, how these efforts are going to interweave to come up with a coherent whole, we hope. Um, and I may, I think a better answer to your question is going to come after you've listened to my two colleagues. But um, for the CDC um, presentation you're going to hear from Dr. Unger, um, that was designed to gather data to address this issue of what is it that people with chronic fatigue syndrome, what are their symptoms and what are their lab values, et cetera. And they, the, the study went to um, disease experts, chronic fatigue syndrome experts around the country, and they, so they are enrolling patients from those, um, from those practices, or gathering data, I think it's, is a fair way to describe it. And so the hope is that though that information will provide a large body of information to d really talk about the spectrum of the disease, what the symptoms are, what lab values they have. So I'm hoping that that will help. Um, the, the other part of that disease, of that recommendation that we received from the CIFSAC in 2012 asked for research definitions, uh, case definitions for MECFS to be developed. Um, so the NIH has sort of taken that and thought about it in different ways, and so it, they're going to be really as I understand it, and, and Susan is going to talk a little bit more about this, they're going to be helping develop a research agenda going forward, which would, and they are going to be including a uh, thorough review of the case, def the existing research case definitions. Um, and so there is going to be some overlap um, with these, these two processes between the IOM1 and the one that's being done at NIH. And we just want to make sure that you take advantage of the information that both groups are gathering. Hi, Nancy. Hi. I have two questions. Um, the first question is, in terms of patients have had questions about what type of patients um, that our clinical case definition will apply to. So the framework I'm thinking of is, as the typical average general practitioner, having a patient come in, how do they go about diagnosing CFS? That's the framework I'm thinking about. So I wanted to assure that that was what DHHS is considering. And my second question concerns um, the different case definitions that are listed. That's a starting point, but if we have points that we want to add to that case definition to make a new case definition that we believe, or the panel depends on the outcome, believes to better represent patients, then that's what we should be aiming for and not just the existing definitions. Is that right? Well, I think, I've, I, may, I think I said that it's whatever you decide. It's, it could be the existing one. It could be the 2003. If you all decide that's a very good definition and nothing can be done to improve it, that's okay. And if you decide you like the 2003 or something else but you want to tweak it a little, that's okay. Or if you want to come up with whole new measures um, because 2003 is 11 years old. Um, so we 
we defer to the expertise that has, is assembled around the table, um, and we have expertise in MECFS. We have expertise in the developing of case definitions and systematic reviews. I think it's a great mix, and so we defer to you. But again, to go back to your first point, um, this I'm hoping that this will be something that can be taught to many, many providers, and that when they come in, they begin to sort of put it on their differential diagnosis, and then they have, they have a knowledge in the head, oh, I can go and I can look at this, and I can see if this is what these people have, and then, you know, get on the phone and ask an expert about it. It's, it's just sort of what you do when you see something that you don't see commonly, but you know you need to make a good diagnosis.